Zoom report slideshow from the beginning. Can't hear any sound. Really? Really. But you can hear me. Yeah. No, I bet I know why. Did you have to click share sound? No, I know why. Okay. If you want to do this, Alan, you'll walk a walk a walk. All right, everybody, welcome to another edition of Think with a Drink. This is the weekly webinar series brought to you by the Aries Foundation for Financial Education. Uh, tonight's episode, we are doing why beneficiaries are important. Uh, as I had mentioned earlier in some of our posts, like that I wanted to actually call it, who's going to get your stuff when you're gone? But Craig thought that that was a little bit too morose as far as the title was concerned, especially for something that's called Think With a Drink, where we want to be a little bit more lighthearted and a little bit more upbeat about things. But the gist of this is understanding who's going to get your stuff when you're gone and why it's important to know and see that and be aware of it. So this isn't going to be titled who pushed grandpa down the stairs. No, that's, that was the, that was an alternate <laughs> title that we also chose not to use. Right. <laughs> who, 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 you know, ran over grandma with a reindeer or whatever. Uh, uh, so our little quick checklist for us here, just before we get started, just know that we are recording this, even though it doesn't appear that way between how we're banter that's going on here. Uh, the microphones are muted, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, and also, you don't have to worry about your cameras being on or off, because for the time being, what we're showing and what's being recorded is just what is on the screen. There is a chat box. So if you do have any questions, please use the chat box feature. And my co-pilot, who I'll introduce in a second, will keep us on pace and answer any of those or bring them up into the conversation if something does appear in the chat box. Speaking of your pilots for tonight's journey, my name is Tom Alessi. I am the president of the Aries Foundation for Financial Education. I have just actually crossed into my 24th year in financial services. I'm an investment advisor. That means I act as a fiduciary whenever giving guidance or advice to any of my clients. I want to bring my vice president, Craig, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. So I'm Craig Richardson, vice president of the Aries Foundation. I've been in the financial services a little over 18 years now. And I work with families and small businesses to help them to find their financial goals and uh, have a better relationship with their money. And as I said, Craig will be chiming in as we go along this evening, but he will also be answering and dealing with the chat box should anything come up in the chat box. I told you that tonight's episode is brought to you by the Aries Foundation for Financial Education. You can visit the website. It's www.ariesfoundation.org. And the mission behind Aries, it's a nonprofit that's trying to help everyone have a better relationship with their money. Because whether you realize it or not, you're in a relationship with money. And just like every other personal relationship that you have in your life, there are emotions and behavioral triggers that happen that can cause us to act well, break down, be a little irrational sometimes when it comes to dealing with our money and our finances. That's all we try to do here at Aries is help everyone get a better handle on that in dealing with their money. Uh, there's an awful lot of words on the screen and Craig has asked me not to read all of those words. So just know we're a nonprofit. We record this, we share it. It's all, the intention is education and information only. All we ask is that if you ever do share it, you share it with the intention of being educational. However, myself, Craig, the rest of the Aries team, we do suggest that if you ever do have questions of a legal tax or professional uh, or, or legal tax or investment, that you seek out the help of a professional to get those questions answered. Boy, see, it was a lot of words anyway there for me going through that. <laughs> All right. Now it takes us to the fun part of the evening. And we call this Think with a Drink because we know some of the topics can be let's say a little overwhelming, a little daunting for some folks and some of the stuff, you know, just downright icky sometimes in terms of dealing with. So we want it to be casual, we want it to be relaxed and we can't think of a better way to do that than to have the audience 
sipping on something cold just to relax them and get them, you know, in the mood to be at least absorbing some of this information. And tonight I am drinking from our friends down at Cisco Brewers. They're on the Cape. They're in Nantucket Brewery. This is called Cold, cold Wave. And to describe this to you, this is this is like what happens when, you know, the, the, the alchemist and the chemistry folks get all a little crazy with stuff. So this is the, the pairing of a American IPA with a Belgian wheat beer. So, yeah, so it, and actually in 2015, they, this was first invented in 2010. Uh, it, it, it became classified as a beer, as a category of beer in 2015. So there is now actually a whole category of white IPAs dedicated, basically. Oh, it's I, like, I want to try that now. Yeah. So I, well, I was going to say to you, you know, uh, Cisco brews it as, as a like a winter. That's why it's called Cold Wave. It's like a winter IPA or a winter beer type of thing. But for me, the whole idea, the whole concept between a white IPA seems to be somebody who's who might be wanting to take baby steps into the IPA world. Like this would be a good, you know, it's, it's, ooh, it's got very, you know, it's nice citrus, good hops there. You know, it's, it, it's nice, but it's lighter. So it's, it's definitely crushable. So I don't know why they wouldn't, you know, make this for you know, <laughs> as a regular IPA type of thing. Cause it's definitely on the lighter side. I don't know if you can see it in terms of the color of that beer, but. Uh, I, I'm drinking, I probably can't be the most opposite extreme. I've got to get this out of my fridge from Bentwater Brewing Company. It's called Boris. Ah, uh, the peanut butter and fudge. Peanut butter and chocolate milk stout. Yes. Yeah. yes. Good. Okay. Yeah, the other opposite extreme. Yeah, that is on the other end of the extreme. Good luck with that, boss, because I believe Boris is like 8.3 or something in terms of the APB. Maybe that i just want to i want to yeah. smell it down it's eight percent yeah yeah <laughs> scroll good luck well good oh, thing he he's not driving this bus this evening not bad though i, I thought it would taste i thought it'd be more peanut butter so yeah bad. no 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 not a lot of you can't get too much peanut butter and you just throw the whole thing off but just to give you a little hint there all right, let's get into this tonight. So the agenda is, you know, not everything passes by a will. We do a whole thing on that as far as going through it, but we'll talk about some of those assets and why it's important. Then the agony of, instead of the agony of defeat, for those old enough to remember the old ABC Wild World of Sports, the agony of defeat, this is the agony of probate and what probate actually makes you go through and what you have to deal with. And then we'll talk about some real life examples that we've run into uh, where uh, problems with the beneficiary designations, and then ultimately who's getting your stuff, which is, do you know who is getting it? Not who's going to get it, but do you know right now who's actually getting your stuff? And we'll open it up for any Q&A at that point. So like we've been doing, the first part of this, though, is just a little bit of feel good, right? We want to start out with a little bit of some things to be thankful for or some reasons that we're feeling good right now. I know I started with you last week, so I'll start this week. And honestly, for me, it's the long weekend coming up. Um, you know, I understand Labor Day is sort of the closeout of the season and the end of summer, but I've always enjoyed the Labor Day weekend. It sort of segues into fall and much more of a cooler weather dude than I am a very, very hot, humid dude. So, you know, Labor Day has always been one of those. I enjoy the long weekend. I enjoy getting away for it and just get a chance to relax before we kick into the fall season. What do I do? What do you got to be thankful for? Uh, I am very thankful that I've got both of my daughters moved into college. Uh, and I am now having my first week of empty nester. Though I'm You're tired. an empty day, an empty nester. Look at that. You're so old. See, you're now an empty. Yeah, now, you now wait a couple of months and you're going to be like, where are the kids? Why aren't they home? I want them around. Like, where are they? That type of thing. You know, so, that way. It's kind of weird. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> there you go. See, something else to be thinking about and looking forward to. That's great. See, life is an empty nester. Just a completely different thing for you now. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Let's get us started with this. So, <clears throat> Understand we're not going deep into the whole will and what happens and, you know, if you don't have one type of thing. What we want to talk about are those assets that 
pass by beneficiary designation, right? So these do not pass by a will. It doesn't matter what your will says, these assets will pass directly by whatever is listed as the beneficiary on them. That's life insurance, any retirement plans, right? 401ks, IRAs, any type of retirement account plan is going to pass by a beneficiary designation. There are some employer provided death benefits, whether that's a life insurance or some other type of, there might be some stock options or something that you can designate a beneficiary for those. That's what we mean by employer provided death benefit. Annuities, annuities, whether they are uh, qualified, which means retirement type or non-qualified, just means regular after tax accounts. All, ben all annuities, Craig, right, have beneficiaries to them. They do. You have to name a beneficiary. Correct. Right. And then savings bonds. Those are those are I bonds and, and E bonds when we're talking about savings bonds. Right. So the, those are bank assets, but they are I bonds and E bonds that actually when you take them out, you name a beneficiary for those. Again, your will is not going to designate where these assets go. It's going to be whoever was written down on the piece of paper whenever you filled it out to say, this is the beneficiary who's going to get this account. Yeah. So even, so even if your will states something different, it's going to go by the beneficiary on the contract, not in the will. Exactly. And that's really what we want to talk about here is the fact that sometimes that gets overlooked. Sometimes the will gets done and thinking, oh, I just set everything up. So that's fine. And we'll go through that when we get into some of those real life examples of why some of this is important and how it does happen and what the triggers are and can occur. But just know there are specifically assets that do not pass through a will. So you've got to be wary of those and understand if you have them or you know are aware of them, who's the beneficiary listed on them. Mm -hmm. Now, there are also assets that, that they, they don't pass by a will because of a certain parameter or designation on them, right? So you can say, hey, I want to leave all my stuff and I leave all my stuff, you know, if I, I'm leaving all my stuff to, I didn't leave all my stuff to Craig because God bless them, I'd be looking over my shoulder all the time. He's already talking about pushing grandpa down the stairs, you know, so, but there are, yeah. <laughs> Get two, three bodies in there, no problem. Yeah, what, what was <laughs> What's that song like? Like Goodbye Earl. That was the uh, <laughs> they stuffed them in the trunk, right? It's... All right, but so assets in a, a bank account, right? And when we say bank account, we mean a bank account or brokerage, even a stock after tax that is only owned by a single person. So if I owned an account, it doesn't matter who I designate in my will because there's no beneficiary on it. That if I pass it now does not pass by will. It will eventually, but it's got to go to probate before that happens. We'll talk about probate in a second. But the idea here is that if you, now a lot of times we run into uh, couples where one individual has passed away. And so they were both on there and now we only have one. And so when, when only one individual is on there, the suggestion is to take the steps to add a second person, whether that's a, a child or an executor or a trustee or somebody else onto the account, because once you pass, that's it. It's blocked. You can't get at it anymore. Yeah, you got to be very careful about that, though, who you add on to your bank account, because they have just as much right to money as you do, regardless of who put it in there. So you got to be careful who you designate in that respect as well. Exactly. Right. But it, if you were concerned for the heirs, it's, it's something to be looking at and dealing with. Same thing with a home, right? So if you're the only person on the deed, then it does not pass if you pass without designating something else to happen to it, because that's it. It's a single entity. It's got to go to probate to figure out what's going to happen with it. Right. And the same thing with your stuff. Like if you own a car, Right, you want a car, and you're the only person on the automobile. That automobile is now you've got to go through appropriate to get that done. Same thing with jewelry and anything else that you might own of value. So these items need to be thought about and dealt with, depending on what you've got. Right, like you said, it's all about your stuff and who's going to get it. 
But now it becomes, how are they going to get it? Well, I mean, you're correct in the fact that, you know, that stuff doesn't necessarily pass by will. It has to go through probate. Well, the will goes through probate anyway. Right. So the whole purpose is the fact that the will can help guide probate as to what your wishes would have been. doesn't mean it'll honor them, but it means that they at least will know what you, like, I wanted this suit to go to this, to my, this. Right, right, right. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely on that stuff. Right. You know, so, and we're really talking more about, like, when we talk about the bank account, the brokerage accounts, the house type of thing, the, the, you know, not that we're not sentimental about your suit or your watch or whatever <laughs> it is you're trying to pass. But the stuff that's got value that needs to pass that now gets tied up in probate. Yeah, you'd be surprised, though, man. I've seen people fight over a toaster. Well, I get it. You know, so right. they could have a sentimental <laughs> attachment to that toaster. You know, you never know in terms of what was there. But the idea with with probate, right? Like, I mean, this is you can literally kiss three to eight percent of your estate, the asset value out the door, because that's what probate's gonna cost you. Basically, that's a national average, just so you know, we're just using this as, as a basis, but it's anywhere from three to 8% of whatever it is you had is going to be taken as part of the probate process. Yeah, you know, court fees, attorney fees, all that stuff to go to it, right. All adds up. And then probate is not this easy, like, okay, we just, you know, we're checking a box and it goes right through the system. Probate takes, what credit, like nine months now? Well, since COVID, it's slowed down significantly. Absolutely. I mean, the part of the problem is what the courts, you know, they're backed up because of COVID. Uh, the other issue is, you know, nobody does this until someone in their family dies. So not, most people have a lot of experience with dealing with probate court. Yeah. Um, another reason why it can be draggy and a little more expensive. It's a learning curve. So, yeah. So there's a there's a lot that has to go through there. But but one of those is with that whole tie up there is that if there were uh, a need for cash for whatever, whether it's to pay off something or or you know a funeral expenses or something like that, the stuff that's in probate is not readily accessible. You can't access the money in these accounts until probate has finished and, and distributed the assets. Right, I mean, the whole point of probate is that they're gonna make a list of all your assets and they're gonna be made publicly available. Yeah, that's the other part, right. And the reason they do that is because if any creditor has a claim or anybody else has a claim to your, those assets, they get 30 days or 60 days. I forget exactly, every state's a little bit different. Right. How long they get to put a claim against those assets. Um, and so once those things are satisfied and no one's come forward, then the court can decide, okay, no one's come forward, we can distribute the asset. If someone does come forward, who knows how long it could take? Because now you're in a yeah. Right. If, 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 <laughs> if somebody's put a claim in, then yeah, I mean, that's part of the problem. That's why you want to try to avoid it as much as possible. Um, one of the other areas, aspects, and, you know, Craig and I spend a lot of time uh, dealing in the special needs community, working with families with a child who's either differently abled or has a disability. And we talk about what we call good intentions with unforeseen consequences. And that's usually that you designated a beneficiary. In this case, it might be a child who has special needs that you didn't realize giving them money can take away from their benefits that they're entitled to uh, from the government, whether that's Medicaid, whether it's SSI, whether it's SSDI. And so a lot of times it's, it's the conversation about making sure everybody knows who the beneficiaries should be, right? Well, and that's the other problem too. I mean, one, people, not everybody has a will, right? I'd say the minority of people actually have a written will that's just all ready to go. People who do don't necessarily update them all the time. Yeah. And also, you know, if you don't name uh, beneficiaries on your other assets where you can name a beneficiary, then it's going to go to your estate. And just by the nature of going through probate, that child could end up getting assets that you never intended it for them to get. Correct. You know, and that's that's one of the things with it. And to, just to make sure and to have, you know, we always talk about when we're dealing with this and talking to families and organizations about, you know, the idea of making sure that you have conversation, there's open dialogue, that everybody's aware, everybody knows what's going on. So, you know, that's one aspect to it. 
all right, so some real life examples here that, that we have run into or, or dealt with, and you know, just to sort of bring this all around to you, you know, so the, the first one I'm going to share with you, this is this is it's not my it's my dad, right? So this is my family, right? So so my I, you know, I'm the guy, I'm the financial guy, I'm the advisor, I'm the, you know, my family is, uh, I'm dealing with everything. And my dad passed away. And unfortunately, he forgot about these stock accounts that he had, right? It, you know, everything else, I know everything else is, I've got everything else set up, no problem, I got it all handled on everything. And then I'm going through all of his stuff after he passed away. And I realized there were these two brokerage accounts, that were just in his name. What I had to go through to try to get the the you know the the hoops and the the, the everything. My sister's the executrix, so we got to deal with her, bring her in, go through this thing, and and wind it through it. And they want to charge us for all of this to you know actually release the accounts. It was just insane what we had to go through, and it wasn't anything to do with my dad other than he just he got old and he forgot. He just forgot he had the accounts. There wasn't a ton of money in them, but it was still just this, he had some mad money that he was playing with, but then he forgot about it. Mm -hmm. And it was like, so I always tell people to go back and check and look at accounts and go through things because uh, clearly if it happened to my family and I'm the guy, it can happen to anybody. You know, so you just want to make sure because if he had put myself or my sister, who again was the executrix on the account, then there would have been no issue. The account would have passed to us, could have been joints with tenant in common or, or you know, right of survivorship or whatever the case may have been. But we would have had an opportunity to then just deal with it seamlessly without having to go through all of the, the you know, months of craziness that I went through. Yeah, and your father probably was one of those, he was a kid during the, the, the Depression era, right? Yes. Yeah. So I've had clients like that who, um, you know, they... People who've lived through the depression tend to have lots of small accounts scattered all over the yeah. place. Yeah. yeah. Right. And like I had this one client and we were working with, she talked to us about this one amount of money. She had like 40 or $50,000. And then she, we went to her apartment this was before COVID and she go, Oh, well, I have this other statement too. And, oh, I have this other account too. She realized how many, she comes back after, you know, like half an hour of looking through different papers. She's got like eight different accounts that, that add up to like $400,000. Right. No, and no one would have had a clue. Right. You wouldn't have been able to find it. You just wouldn't have known. No idea. Right. Right. She had no idea until we made her start looking. Yeah. Um, So yeah, it's common. (laughs) Right. Yeah. No, and it's a problem. It's you know, and and one of the ones I had is more of a heartbreaking one. That that. So I had a client. He got diagnosed with cancer. Now I was I was an advisor to the 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 family. But he had his stuff, right? He had, you know, I'm, I'm doing my own thing here and do my own thing there. And then he got diagnosed with cancer and just said the, the harsh reality stepped in and he pulled me in and just said, look, I want to make sure you know where everything is. Should something happen to me? Should I, you know, because I got the whatever you want to call it, that, that, that you know, like the, the wake up call. I want to make sure that my wife knows where everything is. And I want you to be aware of that. Here's where everything is. We laid it all out. You know, whether I had control of it or not, I knew where everything was. Right. Unfortunately, he got diagnosed with a second form of cancer and passed away. Yes. And going through everything and going back through it with her, doing the sort of like you were doing, like, hey, let's go through all of the papers. Let's go all the details. We came across an old IRA that he forgot about. She or the son were not named as the beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. Someone else was. That account, she could not access. She couldn't know. I mean, the first part was trying to get whoever the beneficiary was, was a nightmare. Because the bank won't, it was in a bank, the bank won't tell you anything. You have no access. There's no advisor on it. There's no person there. It's, it's basically a dead account at that point. Yeah. Couldn't and access. Power, and even power of attorney dies when the person dies. Correct. So we had no access to it whatsoever. She couldn't find out. I couldn't find out. Nobody could find out. We had to literally go through his family tree and have people request to the bank 
to find out whether or not they were named as the beneficiary to the account. Oh, so you couldn't even find out who the beneficiary was? Couldn't find, you know, because they won't release the information. They will only release it to the beneficiary. Oh, so the only other way to do that would be through probate. Well, you that's all. Trustee, whoever the, who's in charge of probate, whoever's chosen. Correct. The attorney go through it, which I think is ultimately what happened in terms yeah. of finding it out. It, it, was, it ended up in a good resolution, but the whole idea of having to go through it and deal with that, when, when again, this is somebody whose entire intention was, uh, here's all my stuff. Right. You know, here's everything. Make sure so none of this stuff is slipping out into the dark. And it was a forgotten account. And oh. so that's why, you know, a lot of times we talk to people about consolidating these accounts, whether they be 401ks, IRAs, whatever, because you have better control and it's not just you have better control but the next generation or whoever your beneficiary or whoever your heir is is going to have an easier time of trying to figure it out well i mean let's face it you know you and i are professionals been doing this almost you know you're over 20 years now i'm just about at 20 years and even when we're trying to deal with probate or these types of issues they get complicated so for your ordinary, you know, person on the street trying to deal with something that they deal with once in a lifetime, and then it's complicated on top of it, it just makes a stressful situation even more stressful. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what the problem, and that's really what this is all about and trying to avoid. It's a good point by you about trying to, you know, take some of that, you know, unneeded stress off the situation. It's hard enough, you know, with somebody who passes, doesn't matter how old they are, doesn't matter who they were. It's, right. it, it's just a hard thing to go through. And then to have this come up and have to go through this, because then it's, wait, I need to get a, a copy or, or, or an actual death certificate. I got to go to the institution. They won't talk to me on the phone. Uh, just, it's a nightmare to deal with. Yeah, and I've seen accounts come in like, you think you're all settled and then something else pops up six months later. Right. They're later and then you're back into it again. Like, oh, I thought I was done with this. <laughs> And so then the the this is the the crew cream to the cream, if you will, of of making sure. So we, we had to deal with a client who inherited uh, an IRA because the beneficiary to the IRA was was had predeceased the owner of the IRA. So it was essentially he inherited an estate IRA through the whole, you know, maculations that go along with that. So the owner of the IRA passed away, had named this individual spouse as the sole beneficiary. She had predeceased him. He had never changed the beneficiary IRA, the beneficiary to his IRA. So when he passed, it went to the spouse of the beneficiary. But at that time, it's an inherited account. So the person who was going to get the money died before the person who gave them the money. Correct. Ah, and so now you've got a situation where the person's not alive to receive the money. So it goes to the estate. And the estate is then whoever is the, then the estate is passing to, at that point, her spouse, because there was a spouse who was still alive. So the spouse is inheriting this IRA. And the problem is, depending on the broker dealer, that you're you're working with or the the provider who's holding the the trust account holder for the uh, IRA they're giving you all types of different advice what we what they were being told at the time was that they had to take a, a there's nothing they could do they had to take a full distribution mm -hmm. there was a significant amount of money in there which was going to hit them with a huge tax bill that was not the case. And this is what, what we tried to walk through with them is that the law actually allows you to take distributions out over based on since the individual was already passed and taking his required minimum distributions, he was older, that you could take it based on his lifetime, his life expectancy. Today's world now with the SECURE Act, you have to take it in 10 years. But it's still better than taking it in a one lump chunk that they were being told they had to take it in. But you have to be able to move that and understand how it goes from the estate to 
the beneficiary to the beneficiary of the estate and all of the pieces that go along with it. So well, just, also, I'm sorry. It also brings it to the point that you want to make sure that when you're dealing with this type of stuff, that you're really dealing with a professional who has experience in it. Because I can tell you, just because you're dealing with a large company doesn't mean that the individual you're dealing with knows what they're talking about. Like you and I have the benefit of doing all this education. So we have no choice but to continue to educate ourselves on all the, the laws so we're giving appropriate information. In this particular case, we happen to have a little more education about that situation than most of the other advisors who were involved. So we were able to help these people to have a, a, a better outcome. But like you said, it could have cost them an extreme amount of money in taxes had we not stepped in and, and saw, well, no, this is how you actually do it. And we actually had to explain to certain individuals, no, this is how you do it. They didn't believe right. this. Yeah. <laughs> like this is a reading business. This is the law. This is what it says. <laughs> so there, there, there are just, there's a lot to go on, but the, the, the fundamental point of this is that always having to go forward and review the designations, right? Review your beneficiaries. We can't stress that enough how often this comes up. There's a couple of reasons for this. We're gonna talk about five reasons that you absolutely should do it. But the examples that we just gave are really the real life reasons why you need to do beneficiary reviews. One, to know where everything is, right? There's the first thing, you know, you gotta know where all the accounts are, so you gotta know all of that. Then two, you gotta know who's getting your stuff as part of it, you know, who's been designated as the beneficiary. And then, Making sure, because one of the things that's not here, we'll talk about it in a second that we haven't talked about, is the backup, right? The contingent beneficiary. It comes up in the next slide. That's that's having somebody who's there in case the primary beneficiary predeceases you, which is what the inherited IRA situation got created by. There was nobody else on the account. So once you, the owner passed, that was it. It was now gone to his estate, and it's an inherited estate IRA, and there's all kinds of crazy rules for that. Yeah, the other thing too, Tom, is not just to know for you to know where all your stuff is, but to have your stuff in a place where someone else can figure it out if you're not around. Because even if you do all the beneficiaries in the right places, if they don't know you have the account, they can never put in a claim. Yeah, no, it's a good point. That's that's one of those things. Like Craig and I, we talk about this as, and what we call it the family big book, right? You, you know, it's that that old. If you think about, you know, I mentioned that about the the Prussian era people, but but having something that designates where everything is. Because it's very, very important because, the, you know, like Craig said, it's so stressful. It's so hard when somebody passes. And then they have to think about not only, gee, where are all their policies, where are all their accounts, but then everything else, you know, where are the subscriptions that they have? And, you know, where's the phone bill and all that stuff that goes along with it? Because, you know, I'm sure like, like my household, like most households, like I've got half the passwords, my wife has half the passwords. Right. So if, if one of us passed, the other one's like floating around, like no idea how to access half of the accounts because they don't access them. They don't deal with them. So the other, the other issue, too, Tom, is a lot of times when people pass, they may be, you know, widowed or a widower. Right. And yeah. now, you know, no one, you know, these companies aren't reading the obituaries to see if you passed away. So if someone doesn't put in a claim, they have no idea in a life insurance policy. All they know is that you didn't pay your premiums anymore. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, like I said, someone has to know where these things are. Otherwise, they just get lost. That's why you go to that mass money found, mass found money. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's where all that stuff is. Buying mass from. money. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All so, five reasons to do a beneficiary review, right? First one is your will is not enough, right? So, we talked about that. The assets that don't pass, the assets that supersede or oversight, you know, that, that that go through this. So if you don't know who's getting your stuff with your accounts, that's why you do the beneficiary review. Mm -hmm. The other is that you go through a life change, whether that's marriage, you know, birth of a child, divorce. You want to change some of those things because it's not necessarily mean that that this is what it should be today. A lot of times especially when somebody in their 20s gets a job, they fill it out. We just did this with my daughter. She put her sister on there as the beneficiary to the retirement account. Great. But in 10 years, hopefully she's married with kids. Like she probably doesn't want to give her sister that retirement account anymore. 
So she wants to go in and then review it and make sure that, hey, look, I got to update that. Maybe it's a husband, maybe there's kids, whatever the case may be. Oh, just because you asked me to make sure we have oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. for this event, right? I did check. And actually, I was right. When you get divorced in Massachusetts, this may not be true in every other state, but in Massachusetts, when you get divorced, it automatically negates the spouse as the beneficiary on a life insurance policy and any other type of beneficiary designation, anything else, like those other assets we talked about. Right. So if you want your ex-spouse to be the beneficiary, you have to go back and rename them again after the divorce. Interesting. And yeah. so if you didn't, and if you had contingents, the contingents become the beneficiary. Automatically. Right. And they just had a court, court case with the Massachusetts Supreme Court back in January of this year and upheld that decision of the probate law. Okay. So, and, and so yeah. then just to follow through on that, if you if you're married, you get divorced and you pass, then your money's going to the estate, which means probate. Right. If there's not a contingent beneficiary, that's correct. Okay. Yep. That's, what I, that's what I wanted you to check on. Thank you for doing that. I appreciate that. Yep. And so that goes hand in hand with do you have a backup plan? And by backup plan, do we mean do you have a contingent beneficiary? There should always be a contingent beneficiary on every designated account. I, even if you are you know, married with no kids, you named your husband, name somebody else, whether it's a sibling, whether it's a, a charity or something that's gonna get your money once you're gone because otherwise you're gonna wind up in probate and yes, the will will dictate it, but you, you're just better off doing it that way. Yeah, and a lot of times, too, you don't put your kids on because they're minors. But now some time has gone by and they may not be minors anymore. And you just go back and revisit it. Right. So like you've suggested to a lot of our clients on an annual basis, just do a quick review. Just a quick review. And the other part of that quick review there is, is it really on file? Right. It's it's one thing to say, hey, OK, I named my husband and the kids, but, you know, that was 10 years ago. Does the HR department still have that on file? Is that <laughs> still there? Like, like it's it's okay to trust that they do have it, but the suggestion is always to verify. Just do a simple, hey, look, can you just tell me who do you have on file as far as my beneficiaries are concerned or, or what's there for the beneficiaries? It's just good practice. Um, and then- Change beneficiary providers. I mean, uh, benefit providers. You know, just never know. So it's just a good idea to always just, again, like I said, it's okay to trust that, you know, the insurance company or that the, the HR department has that on file, but you just want to verify every now and then. And then last one is that you unintentionally create a burden to your heirs, like we talked about, whether that's dealing with a child who's got special needs, whether that's creating a taxable event to your uh, heirs that you were unintended to do. Or again, that's the inherited IRA thing that could create that. So it's just understanding that, that it's always a good idea, as Craig said, to go in and maybe, maybe not every year, but maybe like every two or three years, just do a review. Just take the time, say, all right, these are all of my accounts. I know where everything is. Now these half of those accounts have beneficiaries. I want to check them. Why don't you just uh, do the Prince situation? Don't leave any clue, no will, and then let everybody fight over your estate for eternity. Yes. <laughs> but only if they could draw the symbol, then that's how they were able to, to, to get into the inner circle. No one's getting a little red Corvette out of that deal. Yes. <laughs> and so here at Aries, this is what we try to do with everybody. We try to help everyone have a better vision, a clearer a path in terms of the road ahead. Because we know it zigs, we know it zags, we know there's there's potholes that come up, and some of that is trying to make sure, and whether it might be uncovering or finding or going through some of those old accounts or old paperwork and trying to get there, that's what we do. The other side of that is we offer everybody a chance to sort of go through that path and create their own roadmap, what we call the roadmap to financial awesomeness. And it's a visual tool that helps you put everything so you have an idea and an understanding. And this is a great way we sort of have this as the, the new era version of that family big book. Because this says, this is all of the stuff I have. This is where everything is. 
And this will tell family members, oh, there's a policy here or an account there or whatever the case may be. So it's a good way to do that. If you're interested, you can drop yes into the chat box. Craig has probably already dropped his, his scheduler in. You can make a time to meet with us. We're happy to do that. This is Craig and I, and I'm our formal attire. I'm not going to go into the whole Mac attack versus Brady thing in terms of the Patriots. The football season starts next week. Brady is playing again. We've kept the TV 12 jerseys for now. Just know at some point he's going to retire officially again, in which case we'll probably have to change jerseys. And I'm not one to talk gossip, but I did hear from certain news sports newscasters that part of the reason Brady may have been out was some type of elective uh, plastic surgery. Oh, sure. You know, him and Gisela are having trouble, blah, blah, blah. It's all it's all just a plastic surgery. Like, he had his face changed. Have you seen the yeah. pictures? No. All right, so what, what's on? <laughs> I don't care about these. He's still, still rated as the top player. So we keep the, the thing with a drink going. going. What's on tap? So next week we're doing the recession is coming. The recession is coming. So yeah. what do you do? Yeah. Everybody to get from street, basically. This would for those old enough to remember the Russians are coming. Uh, on 9.15, we're not really sure what we're doing, but we might be live from a, a, a presentation of one of the organizations we support, the Center of Hope Foundation. We're going to be at their gala, so we might try to tie that in. And then on 9.22, we're going to start back to our best places to retire. In this case, we're going to focus on uh, certain specific metro areas, not states, in southeastern USA. Craig, any, be, any question? Be, any, go ahead, one. I would say that beer must be really good because it wasn't the Russians are coming. It was the British are coming. No, it wasn't. It was the, the movie is the Russians are coming. Oh, the movie. Yeah, the movie is the Russians are coming. The Russians oh. are coming. Everybody to get from street. You have to go uh. see it. Go look it up. It was like 1968 or something. It was very, it was a late 60s movie. Anyway, uh, any questions in the chat box for us? I have no questions at this time. Okay, if you ever do have any questions, you can reach out to us. You can either go to the website, that's www.ariesfoundation.org, or you can just send us an email, info at ariesfoundation.org. We're always happy to try to help. Like I said, our mission is trying to help everyone have a better relationship with their money. On that note, I'm going to say thanks and have a great evening.